Good morning and welcome to each one of you who has gathered here today for worship on this beautiful day. We're glad that each one of you is here. We're also glad for those who join us by means of television on station KJBO and we invite you to come and be with us uh, tonight in person. Uh, the Perkins Lectures continue tonight at 7, tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. and tomorrow night at 7.30. You'll hear more about that later, but uh, for those who have just joined us by television, we want you to make a note to come be with us. I would also give you the announcement that we're beginning a new program in our church this week, First Wednesdays, and it's a dinner that you are all invited to be at 5.30 on Wednesday evening. Now this is not the typical potluck dinner. You don't need to bring anything except yourself and your purse and your wallet and uh, come have fellowship. And uh, many of us are at church on Wednesdays anyway. And so this is a handy deal. So we hope that uh, many of you will come and join us on Wednesday evening. I would give you these, these who have been in the hospital or one of our uh, recovery places this week so that you might keep them in your prayers. Sue Babb, Bruce Martin, Francis Sanders, Jody Spinks, Julie Trigg, Lucille Walker, Mark Price, and our sympathy to Cindy Shank in the death of her mother, Dama Shank. Uh, she died February 24th and her services were the 26th in Archer City. You'll know that we have many special guests with us this morning in worship, and the very first of those is Dr. Gerald Turner, president of Southern Methodist University, who comes now to lead us in our call to worship. Thank you. Would you please stand for the call to worship and uh, respond as shown on your program? It is good to sing praise to our God, for our God is merciful and gracious. God is great and wonderful power and love. Sing to God with thanksgiving. Let us sing to God with praise as we worship our God in Christ. Thank you. to 539, hymn 539.
worship service on a First United Methodist Church in the heart of Wichita Falls. Children, youth, and adults find new hope and meaning in life through a relationship with Jesus Christ and the many activities at First United Methodist Church. Thanks for joining us today in our beautiful sanctuary at 10th and Travis, the heart of the city of Wichita Falls. join me in the affirmation of our faith, uh, the Apostles' Creed, page 881 in your hymnal, 881. Please say it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the congregational prayer printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Merciful and loving God, the maker of us all, whose eye is even on the sparrow, you care with tenderness and grace for this world that you have created. We pray that through your loving spirit, you would renew your people and your entire creation and make us whole once again. We praise you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to bind up our brokenness and to heal our wounded spirits. Enable us to be faithful followers of Christ, that we may be the true body of Christ in the world. We pray in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
As we have a moment of silent prayer together, please remember those members and families that John mentioned earlier and others who need the prayers of the church. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we dare to approach you in prayer because you have promised to be with us when we gather in your name. We approach you wearied by the world with which we contend, and we confess before you, O oh God, the dimness of our understanding and our hardness of heart. Forgive us our separation from you and our callousness toward one another. Lord, we praise your mighty name for the strength of your word and the power of your grace. We thank you for that portion of your truth we comprehend and for that mystery of the gospel beyond our comprehension. Most of all, we express gratitude for your word made flesh, Jesus the Christ. Dear Lord, we are especially thankful today for those who have made this lecture series possible and for this one who is to lead us. We are grateful for his life and his faith and his witness. Speak through him the word most needed, and make each of us open and receptive to your word for our lives. Bind us together in a shared faith, a common witness, and compassionate service to the world. Through Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I too wish to welcome you this morning to our first in the Perkins Lecture Series. This is the 70th year for it. We're glad that you are here, both member and visitor, as well as those who are watching us on television this morning. Uh, at this time, we are, uh, we'll take a moment to greet one another, but before we do or after we do, uh, please make sure you register your attendance with us this morning. The tablets are on the center ends of the pews. Especially let us know if you have any change in your address, email, or phone numbers. 
But at this time, we do have uh, some folks visiting with us, so seek out somebody you don't know, and you might meet a member who's been a member here for 20 years, or you might meet somebody that this is their first Sunday. So let us stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. I knew I... I neglected to uh, inform the children, because we changed our order a little bit uh, of worship this morning, uh, if our children would come down now for our children's sermon, if Keo can play Jesus Loves Me or something like that, <laughs> but if the uh, children will come forward for our children's How's everybody this morning? Y'all, uh, some of you look like it's Easter. Y'all are so dressed up and look so nice and pretty. Uh, I've got one, two, I think I've got four questions that uh, I want to ask you. Number one, uh, who can tell me where we are right now? Hmm. Where are we? We're in church. That's right. All right. Now, who can tell me, if anybody, how old is this church? How old? How many? 50? Pretty good guess. Yes, sir. 165? Yeah. You may be confusing the church with John. I, 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 William? Since 1943. No, we're older than that. No, not 500. The, the Christian church is like 2,000 years old, but not, not this church. All right, I'll tell you. This church, I believe, is 131 years old. And you were close, that's right. And this building was built in... Uh, I believe it was 1920, uh, 20, 1927. So uh, your homework assignment is to figure out how old this building is. All right. Who will tell me why you're here? Why are you here? To learn about God. Good. To learn about God. There seems to be a theme here. <laughs> Come to worship. That's right. To learn about God and to worship. Boys. I'm sorry. Worship God. To play. Worship. That's right. Uh, okay. We're here to worship. We're here to... Uh, uh, learn more about God. We're here to pray. We're also here. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you can't have fun. We're here to have fun and fellowship. One last question. Who is the church? 
Who is the church? This is God's house. Who is the church? No. No. Jesus, this is Jesus is in God's house, but who, hmm? Have you ever heard, have you ever heard that we are the church? Yes. That you are the church, I am the church, and you know what Jesus wants you to be? When you go to school, or when you're in your home, or when you're playing with friends, or when you're in the store, Jesus wants you to be his eyes. He wants you to be his ears. He wants you to be his mouth. He wants you to be his hands and feet. In other words, he wants you to love others and to do what you can to help others, okay? So remember, the church is more than a building. The church is you and me and everybody in this room right now and everybody else that's worshiping God, okay? Let's say a prayer and go sit back down. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you that you love us and call us to be the church. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Hear this reading from 2 Chronicles, the 18th chapter, selected verses. Now Jehoshaphat had great riches and honor, and he made a marriage alliance with Ahab. After some years, Jehoshaphat went down to Ahab in Samaria. Ahab slaughtered an abundance of sheep and oxen for him and for the people who were with him, and induced him to go up against Ramoth Gilead. King Ahab of Israel said to King Jehoshaphat of Judah, Will you go with me? He answered him, I am with you, for my people are your people. We will be with you in the war. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. 
Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 of them, and said to them, Shall we go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? They said, Go up, for God will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no other prophet of the Lord here of whom we may inquire? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one other by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, son of Imlah. But I hate him, for he never prophesies anything favorable about me, but only disaster. Jehoshaphat said, Let the king not say not such a thing. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. The messenger who'd gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the words the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. Uh, but the prophet said, As the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that I will speak. And when he'd come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall I refrain? The prophet answered, Go up and triumph. They will be given into your hand. But the king said to him, How many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And then Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you? that he would not prophesy anything favorable about me, but only disaster. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the 68th lecture, or the 67th lecture in uh, the 70-year history of the Perkins Lectures at First United Methodist Church of Wichita Falls. As I have read many of the names who have spoken in this lecture series before in its 70-year history, I am aware that when I read those names, I'm reminded of both theological and biblical scholars who have had a great impact on Christian thought and on the education of persons for Christian ministry. There have also been some of the country's finest preachers who have spoken in this lecture series at the First United Methodist Church in Wichita Falls. Yet in all of that 70-year history, never before has the Dean of Perkins School of Theology been the Perkins Lecturer at First United Methodist Church. No Dean of Perkins in its history in this lecture series. And as Joe and Lois Perkins so generously gave to Southern Methodist University a gift for the School of Theology, which then began to bear their names, how fitting it is that the Dean of Perkins School of Theology speak this day at First United Methodist Church. Dean Lawrence assumed the position at Perkins in August of 2002, and de- during his tenure I've been privileged to serve as the chair of the executive board of Perkins School of Theology, thereby giving me a front row seat into some significant milestones in the School of Theology's life, uh, one of which I had a great interest in, and that was the renovation and the construction of new buildings, especially Elizabeth Perkins Prothrow Hall, in which so many academic settings then were created for the education and the formation of students, men and women, for Christian ministry. Bill brings commitments not only to theological education, but also to the United Methodist Church. Passions and commitments which I share with him. He's taught and served at three other United Methodist Schools of Theology or seminaries, Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Duke Divinity School, and Wesley Theological School of Theology in Washington, D.C. He also, his last appointment as a minister was as the pastor of the Metropolitan United Methodist Church in the District of Columbia, known as the National United Methodist Church. Currently, he serves as SMU's liaison to the United Methodist Church. He's a president of the Judicial Council of the United Methodist Church, and he is a man who's committed to the Christian faith. With him this morning is his wife, Naomi. Uh, They are the parents of two sons, and they have four grandchildren. So it's with my 
It's a deep honor that I present to you and welcome Bill Lawrence as the lecturer of the Perkins Lecture at First Shannon Methodist Church of Wichita Falls. Welcome, Bill. Good morning. The Lord be with you. When I review the list of lecturers, the people who have served as Perkins lecturers, the people who have stood in this place to deliver the Perkins lectures over the last 70 years, I'm greatly honored not only to be in their company, but also deeply humbled to realize how much I owe personally to so many of them. This is the oldest and finest lecture series of its type in the country. And the generosity of your invitation to me to be the 2013 lecturer is a gift for which I feel profound gratitude. I'm grateful to an enormous array of people, to the lecture committee, the Perkins Lecture Committee, of course, to all of you of First United Methodist Church of Wichita Falls, to your pastors and leaders, especially those who have important responsibilities in preparing for the four settings of worship and conversation that feature the lectures. I'm grateful to your senior pastor, Paul, to your music director, Kristen, to your organist, Keo. I know that every time we come here for the Perkins Lectures, the music is going to be splendid and the pastoral welcome extraordinary. I'm also grateful that on this occasion, this year, this morning, my three supervisors are here. <laughs> Dr. Gerald Turner, president of the university, who hired me 11 years ago. Bishop Mike McKee, who I hope will, for the 12th year, appoint me to be the dean of Perkins School of Theology. And my wife, Naomi, who married me 44 years ago. But more than anything, I have to say I'm grateful to the long line of lecturers who have spoken here. Madeline Langell was here in 1996. By my count, she was the only one of the Perkins lecturers in 70 years who was neither a preacher nor a professor nor both. But what a great source of inspiration she was through her writings. She wrote books that we have given to children. She wrote books that I have found inspiring as an adult. Edmund Steinle lectured here in 1974. I recall during my teenage years when I was pondering whether God was calling me into the ministry that I would listen to Edmund Steinle's remarkable sermons on the radio series The Protestant Hour. And I realized that great preaching like his happened when a preacher spoke with a power of quiet grace. A decade later, I went to seminary in New York, and I realized that Edmund Steinle was to be one of my teachers, so I enrolled in one of his courses. And that's when I discovered that Dr. Steinle preached with quiet grace, but was a severe critic of his students' efforts. In what became two semesters with him, I realized that a really great teacher is one who tells the truth to students whether they want to hear it or not. And I realized from him that we can learn a great deal through quiet grace, but perhaps a lot more through a critique that tells the truth. Ralph Sockman was the lecturer here in 1960. Before people ever used the term megachurch, Ralph Sockman had built one in the middle of New York City. Christ Church Methodist hosted thousands of people for worship every Sunday, in addition to the millions who heard Dr. Sockman every week on the radio. He had amazing pastoral gifts. I have talked to people who recall meeting him once. And years later, they could encounter him on the streets of New York, and he'd look at them and call them by their first name. I met Dr. Sockman when I was an undergraduate. He came to our campus to discuss values and choices. What I expected to see was a superstar minister. 
Instead, what I saw and heard was a man of faith talking from his heart as a pastor. He discussed with us a funeral that he had conducted just before traveling to our campus. That day I learned from him that effectiveness in ministry, whether one serves a megachurch or a mini-church, depends on one's having the heart of a pastor. I suspect that just as the list of lecturers is important to me personally, it also has private significance for you. Some, I'm sure, brought messages that touched you at a trying time. Some gave lectures that led you to new insights about faith in Christ. Some, I'm certain, lifted your souls and perhaps one or two lulled you to sleep. But let's not restrict ourselves to private feelings or subjective reactions. It's always risky to limit our perceptions of the faith and our perspectives on scripture to what we think personally or how we feel privately. It's always a mistake to do that, and the Bible itself shows us why. Take that episode in this morning's reading from Second Chronicles, where King Ahab said he really did not want to consult the prophet Micaiah, because Micaiah never had nice or favorable things to say about him. Well, at least Ahab was honest. He was interested less in the truth of God's word than he was in feeling good about God's word. But the Perkins lectures exist so that we can focus on finding the truth of God's word. Just think about the situation when the Perkins lectures began 70 years ago. The whole world was at war. The Nazis were in control of Europe. It would be more than a year after the Perkins lectures began here in this space. More than a year until MacArthur could keep his promise and return to the Philippines. The war was raging and in 1943 nobody knew what the outcome would be. In the spring of 1943 nobody could know the truth of what the world was going to face. It was a terribly troubling time for the church and the world. In the same era that the lectures began, Joe and Lois Perkins also gave a great gift, as Bishop McKee has said, to the School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. I'm convinced that those two acts, creating the lecture and endowing the School of Theology, were really part of a single sign of the tremendous acts of generosity, but even more than that, the tremendous sense of courage and purpose with which Joe and Lois Perkins did those things. The opening words of the statement that accompanied the gift to the School of Theology said that their vision in endowing the school was nothing less than, and I quote, the future peace of the world, end quote. The first of the lecturers who came here was Roy L. Smith, a man who had served the church in numerous ways, pastor, denominational executive, delegate to some difficult general conferences of the church. One of them was in 1939 when Methodists decided to reunite northern and southern branches of the church that had split a hundred years earlier over slavery. He was a delegate to the general conference when the church decided that in order to accomplish that reunion, we would have to create a racially segregated denomination so that black and white Methodists wouldn't have to be connected to each other in one church. Just think how uncertain was the mood, how fearful was the world, how troubled was the time in 1943 when Dr. Smith spoke here. Pearl Harbor had been attacked just 15 months earlier and the stench from its smoking ruins was still clinging to Americans' nostrils. In 1943, there was no clarity at all about how the war was going. All that anybody knew was that nearly every able-bodied young man and a whole lot of young women were going into it. 
Thousands of Methodist churches like this one were posting bulletin boards in their fellowship halls and Sunday school rooms with the names of members who were in uniform at domestic training bases all over the country, at battlefronts in North Africa, or in posts in Europe or the Pacific. And next to some of them, some of those names were gold stars, lest anyone needed reminding that some of the people with those names would never return. In 1943, when the Perkins Lectures began, Northern and Southern Methodists barely had time to become acquainted with the idea of being, re being reunited. In 1943, when the Perkins Lectures began, black and white Methodists had barely been able to ponder what it meant to be divided by race. The nations of the world were tearing each other asunder. Germans were being told that their fellow citizens who were Jews or homosexuals or the disabled could not be tolerated. And Americans were being told that our fellow citizens who had Japanese ancestry could not be trusted. The Bible says we're one in Christ, but segregation was dividing the church, separation was dividing the cultures, conflagrations were consuming the world. In 1943, when the Perkins Lectures began, the world and the church were at an uncertain crossroads. And they faced that crossroads with the experience of the decade just behind them, a decade of what journalist Timothy Egan calls the worst hard times. It was the Dust Bowl of the 30s. Through the Great Depression, people in the middle of America had grown desperate and were dying. A woman from West Texas whose husband had died of dust pneumonia, as it was called, was trying to live as a widow with her children in an underground shack so they could escape the blowing topsoil over top of them. But her plight was hopeless, and she just kept shouting, God help us, God help us. It reached the point where a judge took her children away from her and committed this West Texas woman to what was called an insane asylum that was located right here in the city of Wichita Falls. Into that situation, with the lingering effects of the Depression and the looming uncertainties of war, the truth had to be told. Not the truth about how bad it was in what looked like a dying world, but the truth about a living faith in a living God through a living church that had good news to offer to the dying world. So Lois and Joe Perkins did what from my reading seems to have been characteristic of them. They found ways to meet the biggest array of challenges with an even bigger message of hope. They decided to bring a word of deliverance to this city on the edge of the dusty high plains. They decided to bring a word of peace to a city that was wrapped in the realities of global war. They decided to bring the strongest voices of faith to speak where people still had personal memories of eight years earlier, Palm Sunday, 1935, when a dust storm so bad that it rolled across two-thirds of the country had changed the name of the Sunday before Easter from Palm Sunday to Black Sunday, a storm that shrouded more than half of this nation in blowing dirt into a world that thought it might die of dust and then wondered whether it would be destroyed by the demons of war. Joe and Lois Perkins invited lecturers who would bear witness to the living faith in a living God through a living church for a dying world. So into this pulpit stepped Roy L. Smith nationally known Methodist minister whose mission was just to tell the truth. The only way to be delivered from the Great Depression and the only way to win freedom from fear in a time of greater war is to tell the truth. After all, Jesus had promised, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
The Smith was famous in his time in part because he had the ability to express the truth in simple, snappy, short sentences. Among other things, he said, more people are troubled by what is plain in scripture than by what is obscure. That may be one of the most basic and insightful things ever said about the Bible. There is plenty in the Bible that is just too obscure, of course. Many of us have our doubts about the plausibility of Moses opening the Red Sea with a staff in his outstretched arm. Many of us wonder about the credibility of Jesus turning water into wine at a wedding of Cana of Galilee. Many of us have intellectual doubts about these things because they are matters our minds cannot comprehend. They are mysteries that surpass our understanding. Some of the greatest leaders in the history of the church have been the women and men who acknowledge their doubts about the faith and the scriptures. One of the most famous spiritual leaders of the 20th century, Mother Teresa, kept a journal which was revealed only after her death and in which she confessed the matters of faith that caused her to have profound doubts. One of the most famous preachers in the 20th century, Harry Emerson Fosdick, refused to recite the creed that we recited in this sanctuary this morning because he had doubts of much of what was written in it, including his personal doubts about the bodily resurrection of Jesus. When Fosdick was faced with having to decide whether to accept an invitation from the wealthiest man in America, John D. Rockefeller Jr., to become the pastor of the philanthropist church, Fosdick told Rockefeller that he did not want to be the pastor of the richest man in America. And in reply, Rockefeller said to Fosdick, are more people going to be upset with you about my wealth than are going to be upset with me about your theology? We all have doubts about things that we do not understand in the Bible. But relatively speaking, those things are easy to manage. The hardest stuff in the Bible is not what we find obscure. The hardest stuff in the Bible is what we know to be true. The toughest things in the Bible to swallow are the things that we know are the truth. We know that Jesus said we should love our neighbors as ourselves. That's not obscure. We know what Jesus tells us to do. We just don't want to do it. Or at least, we don't want to have to love all of our neighbors. There's a neighbor of ours whose dog regularly leaves a steaming pile on the landscape lawns. I'm not going to love him until he learns to take better care of his pet. There's the neighbor who uses the same medical doctor that I do. She knows she's not supposed to use her cell phone in the waiting room. There's a sign right on the wall. But there's sick people in that waiting room who don't need to overhear her personal or professional business in the conversation. I'm not going to love her until that phone runs out of battery power. And what about the neighbor who crosses the border illegally? Or the neighbor whose children bullies our children. Or the neighbor who has a felony conviction for sexual misconduct. The truth is that we know, Jesus said, we have to love our neighbors as ourselves. We understand his words. We know what he meant. It's just that there are some whom we cannot possibly bring ourselves to love. We understand what Jesus said. We just wish he hadn't said it. Which brings me back to the scripture lesson this morning about a rather obscure fellow named Micaiah. That's Micaiah, not Micah, 
the prophet who managed at least to get a little book of prophecy in the pages of the Old Testament. This Micaiah has only one brief moment in the whole Bible, although the story is good enough to be repeated twice, once in 1 Kings, once in 2 Chronicles. It's a story about the political intrigue between two kings, Ahab of Israel, Jehoshaphat of Judah. Through an arranged marriage that linked their families, they formed an alliance. The question of the moment was, should they join forces militarily and go to war against a common enemy? King Ahab clearly wanted that to happen. He welcomed King Jehoshaphat and staged a huge feast for him and his entourage. Jehoshaphat, as pleased as he was with the food and the wine and the fellowship, said before he fully agreed to enter into a military alliance, he wanted to get a word from the Lord. Ahab was ready. He had previously lined up 400 prophets to declare that such a war would be the will of the Lord. Jehoshaphat was impressed but said, have you got any other prophets besides these 400? Well, there is one, Ahab said, a prophet named Micaiah. But Ahab said of Micaiah in one of the greatest texts in the Bible, I hate him. He never prophesies anything favorable about me, only disaster. But Ahab knew he had no choice because the request had come from Jehoshaphat. So Ahab ordered that Micaiah be consulted, and after a bit of hesitation, Micaiah told the truth. He told King Ahab that the word of the Lord was not to enter into the military alliance, not to go to war, or he would be defeated. But by this point, Ahab had already decided that he, perverted, he preferred his own ideas to God's truth. So he put Micaiah in jail and led his troops personally into battle, which is when it became clear that Micaiah had told him the truth. Ahab's army was defeated, and Ahab himself was mortally wounded in the fight. It's a strange thing how often people of faith have resisted the word of the Lord when his word does not fit our preferences or our prejudices, we do what Methodists did in 1940 and create a racially divided church. If we're not ready or willing to heed God's word of truth, we set it aside or work around it. After all, there are some neighbors we're not ready to love. There are some outcomes we'd rather not occur. There are some results we wish we did not have to accept. King Ahab was hardly the only person of faith who preferred his own tactics to God's truth. And all that it cost him was his kingdom and his life. Sometimes our own prejudices cloud our eyes, confuse our ears, and keep us from trusting the truth of God. But here's the question. How, in God's name, can we know what is the truth? Jesus was not making an empty promise when he said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He was making his power available to us all. That's the thing about opening ourselves to the truth of God. It puts us in touch with the power of God. And what I want to offer this morning is a chance to put ourselves once more in contact with the power of God. In my lifetime, I have been at three places of great power. One of them is a place that you can never go. One of them is a place I hope you never have to go. And one of them is a place that I hope at least some of you, someday, will get to go. I've been to a place of great power where you can never, ever go. 
It's at the site of the last job on which my father, my late father, worked before he had to retire on disability. My father was an eighth grade dropout who'd become an apprentice plumber and who then, after he returned from service in the Pacific in World War II, became a foreman on major construction projects. His last construction project was a nuclear power plant. Near the completion of the project, he was permitted to bring guests for guided tours of the facility. As I walked with him on the tour, we came to a location that was soon to be closed to visitors forever. It was the reactor core. Before the fuel rods were loaded into the assembly, I stood at that place of immense power, realizing that once the nuclear reactions began, no person would ever be allowed in that space for hundreds of thousands of years. The plant has been operating for almost 30 years now. It's a place of great power, but you can never, ever go there. I've also been to a place of great power where I hope you never have to go. It's one that my wife and I experienced nearly 20 years ago. We were living in North Carolina. A hurricane was approaching from the southeast coast. Forecasters assured us that our area would be west of the heaviest rains and the strongest winds. We prepared ourselves for the likelihood, the certainty that the power would go out. And then we settled down and tried to get some sleep through a long night of stormy weather. It was truly, to use the old cliche, a dark and stormy night. At some point shortly after midnight, we lost electrical power. But then the wind continued to grow intensely. The rain sounded like a steady barrage of bullets being fired at the exterior of our house. It lasted for hours, and radio reports on the battery power that we had crackled with the news that the hurricane had changed course. It was headed directly for us. And the only option then was to take cover in whatever way we could and endure the battering through the night. We heard things outside exploding and snapping and crashing. And then, about 4.15 in the morning, suddenly, everything got quiet. The wind eerily stopped. The rain began to fall as a gentle mist. That lasted for 45 minutes until the wind picked up again, but came less intensely and from the opposite direction. And that's when we realized we'd been in a place of great power. We had been literally in the eye of the storm. In dawn's early light, we could see huge trees that had fallen blocking the roads in all directions. We could see other trees that had crashed through and smashed the roofs of our neighbors' homes, and we could see that although our house was mostly unscathed, we had been in a place of great power. I hope you never have to go there. I've been to a place of great power where you can never go. I've been to a place of great power where I hope you never have to go. And I've been to a place of great power where I hope that at least some of you someday are willing to go. It was a place just like this one, a Methodist church, a chancel rail. I was kneeling, surrounded by a group of clergy whose arms were outstretched over my head and whose robes encircled me and enfolded me like a tent. It was an ordination service when I heard a bishop say that I'd been given authority to administer the sacraments and preach the word. The altar of a church is a place of great power. One day, you should go there.
if you are willing. Not necessarily to be ordained in the ministry, but simply to allow yourself to be in touch again with the power of the truth of God that can set you free. I recall such a moment in one of the Methodist churches that I served many miles from here. A member of the congregation had become involved in an extramarital affair. It eventually led to the end of her marriage and it left her with a burden of great guilt. The more she counseled with me, the more I realized there was nothing I could offer in the way of healing. But I knew where the power was. So I asked her to write a prayer of confession. I asked her to confess everything. And then we met in the sanctuary of the church at the altar. She knelt at the rail. I knelt on the other side. And she read aloud her confession in the space where only God and I could hear it. Once she faced the truth, she could feel the power of forgiveness. The power of a living faith and a living God through the living church is available when we offer the truth to a dying world. Someone comes forward seeking the sacrament of baptism and we touch the power of God through cleansing water. Someone lifts open hands to receive the bread and cup of Holy Communion and we touch the power through simple elements that tell a sacred story. Someone confesses the truth to the world and by the power of the Holy Spirit we bring a living faith in a living God through a living church to a dying world. And that truth is enough to set us free. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence, for bringing us an amazing word today. I ask the ushers to come forward now as we receive our tithes and our offerings. Would you pray with me, please? Creator God, the God of justice, the God of all of our neighbors, we take this time, Lord, today to share the bounty that you have given us so that all of our neighbors might be blessed by that fact. Amen.
Let us remain standing as we prepare to sing our closing hymn. As always, when we come together to worship our God, we also close with an invitation. There be any present this morning who for the first time wish to profess their faith in Christ as Lord, or who wish to become a part of our congregation, a part of our family, we invite you to come. Meet us at the steps of our altar as we sing number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory. Again, delighted to have you in worship this morning, and don't forget this evening, the series continues at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Now let us join together in our benediction. Go into the world with faith. Go into the world with hope. Go into the world with love. Amen and amen.